It's World Mental Health Day. And today on the stream, we will be talking about a growing mental health crisis among Syrian refugees. But first, Malika will share what people are discussing online around the day itself. There's been an outpouring of personal stories and messages of support online under the hashtag WMHD17. One in four adults and one in 10 young people will experience a mental health problem, Kara tweets. Be kind. While Matt sends a reminder that mental health problems are not luxuries nor first world problems. Now it's a point made clear by the International Rescue Committee, which tweeted this video of displaced Iraqi children recovering from trauma by using breathing and meditation techniques. And though mental health affects everyone, some online pointed out persistent stigma, in many cases involving men, and in others simply due to a lack of understanding. Now it's a challenge some are addressing head on. One of those people, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, has spoken about his plans to reduce stigma. We've seen over the past few years the difference first aid training has to preventing people suffering from physical uh, ill health, but also how we respond to that. I'm hoping having better mental health awareness will lead to few people suffering from mental health uh, issues. Those that do, they won't feel stigmatized or receive the help uh, they need. It. The stigma just mentioned around mental health is just one of many barriers to treating Syrian refugees. Many have experienced or witnessed atrocities during the war in Syria, now in its seventh year. That war has created a staggering number of refugees, more than five million. Many are at risk of psychological trauma and in need of mental health services to cope with often brutal memories from home and the difficult journey to escape and start life in a new country. Turkish authorities have estimated that 55% of the 3 million Syrian refugees there need mental health care, while half of those families believe they need psychological support. In Germany, which has taken in almost 270,000 Syrian refugees, one study estimates 50% have mental health issues and have been victims of violence. Resources to address mental health are scarce, but experts say immediate treatment is needed to avoid long-term damage. Here's one way a Syrian child expressed the trauma he experienced in war. Have a look. So just how difficult is it to receive treatment? Well, here to help us discuss the challenges in helping refugees cope with trauma, Dr. Zahir Sahloul is the founder of Med Global and former president of the Syrian American Medical Society. In Turkey, Leila Adja Atik is clinical director for the Maya Foundation. And in Berlin, Hamed Shahabi is a peer counselor with the International Psychosocial Organization. It's good to have you here, everybody. Dr. Zahir, you are uh, living your work on your Twitter feed. If, have a look here uh, on Dr. Zahir's Twitter feed. It, it, for your image, you have an amazing picture here of, uh, tell me what's here, what's that picture? because you know that picture very well. I put this picture on my Twitter feed uh, four years ago uh -huh. um, when I met uh, this child in Aleppo yeah. during one of the missions. He was second grade. And uh, when you ask a child to draw something, he, they usually draw pictures of happy children playing, mm. uh, rivers, sky, and sun. And this child drew uh, helicopters dropping barrel bombs and houses on fire and children yeah. who are mutilated and crying. Goodness. And that's to me is very painful. So I kept this picture to remind me of the reality in Syria because many times we talk about numbers and statistics, uh -huh. but we have to focus on the people. And we just did that. We just did that. Yes. It's like half of 270,000 and Turkey has 3 million. And we did statistics, but we didn't drill down into individual personal stories. There's one other set of pictures that I want to tell our audience about. You asked the kids to draw life before the yes. war in Syria life after the war. Have a look at the video because look very carefully at the difference. Dr. Sahir, talk us through this. Well, uh, children are smart and they don't lie. And uh, what they draw is basically the reflection of reality. And they drew pictures of happy life uh, before the war 
of them playing, of sun, of rivers, of uh, green uh, uh, trees. And then after the war, that has changed completely. And this is the um, basically the reflection of the war on themselves, on their psyche. Many, many times children cannot express it by words, but they can express it by drawing. And art therapy is one way to deal with psychological <coughs> trauma. And this is one way to make them express what's happening to them. Uh, so uh, we use art therapy in the Syrian American Medical Society and other NGOs to treat children with psychological trauma, among other things. So here's uh, someone who's, uh, that picture really struck them. This is Maureen Salim, a doctor on Twitter who wrote, pick drawn by a refugee child, absolutely tragic. Did anyone notice that the child drawn with, a uh, child was drawn with a smile, heartbreaking. And I'll just zoom in here so you can see that. So this is a. Uh, uh, that, that that's amazing. You know, this child drew the, 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 the children who are dead are smiling mm -hmm. and the children who are alive are crying. So imagine this trauma to this child that he believes that all children who are alive are, are, are crying and they're hurting mm -hmm. and the children who are dead are in better place. And this is the reality in Syria because it's not only that you are in a refugee camp, but inside Syria, you're, day after day, you are exposed to extreme level of trauma and violence and you have to deal with it and sometimes with very limited support by the community because of the stigma of mental health because of the fact that many healthcare professionals do not have the training to provide mental health and uh, first aid psychological first aid and actually Leila that's why I wanted to bring you in here because I know you participate you you facilitate workshops of art therapy and you have your own story of uh, when a child was drawing a picture of a mosque can you tell us that story um, we do get a lot of children who are drawing um, stories um, and memories and um, incidents that they have witnessed or they have heard. And one of those incidents was this child was drawing a mosque and he drew something that was flying on top of it, of the picture. And I asked him what, what was happening in the picture and he said that the mosque was about to be, uh, to be bombed. And he said that nobody, nobody was going to survive. Um, so then we talked about it a little bit more, and he told me that this was an actual um, incident that he witnessed, and that he knew that the people inside didn't survive, and he was just a passing by. Um, so I asked him if there was anything he would want to do and change in this picture, and he said that he would want to save the people that were um, being attacked. So then he said that he could call the mosque and tell the imam that they were about to be attacked. And then also call the ambulances and warn them so that they could go and reach to the people and give them some help. So through this drawing and through an art therapy intervention, he was able to take control of his very traumatic memory and maybe escape from reliving it over and over again and have some sort of control over um, what's haunting him in his head. Because these are really vivid memories and real incidences that they have witnessed. And um, most of them have lost loved ones in these um in these wars um, and in these instances, attacks. Emma, there was a time when you were at the Berlin main bus station, and I think it illustrates that even when you're out of immediate danger, that when you're a youngster, in fact, anyone who's been in the Syrian war, that that trauma continues. There was a child, and I want you to tell the story. Can you finish it for me? Exactly, I was about to bring it up, actually. Well, that was one of the most moving moments for me after all this chaos that was going on because it was still so fresh, the refugee crisis, and we were at the central bus station in Berlin where we were just receiving many people coming or receiving friends or whoever. And then there was a lady coming out of a bus where just an usual aircraft uh, in the sky of Berlin was just passing by. And then that child just ducked down, had his head on the ground, and was just shouting and screaming. And you can see how much unstable he was, how much the mother was helpless, the father was helpless, to deal with what's going on there. So maybe the first reaction is to yell at him, and this is also cultural, and then just to say to him, just to shut up or to keep, it, uh, keep it low, we're in public or something. But there, there I saw how much help is needed, how much we need awareness, and we need to do something ourselves. Let's talk about getting that help. I want to show you a little clip from a Save the Children campaign. They were talking about invisible wounds. So this is mental health for adults and also for kids. Have a look at this story from a Syrian family.
عندي امل انه يعني اوصل لتركيا مشان اعالج هذا الصغير بس ما بعرف شو تفكيره انه لما يش... انه عم يشوف انه عم يخاف بس بعرف انه بيخاف لما يسمع صوت الطياره بخاف هيك بيركن يعني شلون شل... انا وابو نتساعد عليه شيء على ظهري شيء على كتافي كل النواحي نفسيا وجسميا بس سبحان الله الامل اني هالطفل يتعالج يعني اتمنى يعني انه اوصل لمكان وعالج صدقا لحد الان الفكره ببالي Dota, I, I, I defy anyone to watch that and not to feel pain. Where do you start? You have traumatized parents, you have a traumatized child, no longer in Syria, no longer in danger. What do you do? How do you start? Um, it's difficult for a Syrian not to feel pain and have tears in their eyes when they hear these stories because it happened with every family in Syria. We're talking about the worst humanitarian crisis in our lifetime where most of the population have been affected. My nephew himself uh, had the same uh, issues that this child had where he was afraid of hearing airplanes and jets because he was in the city of Homs and uh, in the middle of the bombing. So every time he hears an airplane, it's, you know, it brings memories with him. So that's the typical post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, uh, disorder, PTSD doesn't happen only to children but happens also to adults and it stays with them for the rest of their lives and uh, so these children and adults are traumatized they uh, are not able to uh, uh, cope with the realities uh, they are under pressure in the refugee camps when they go to the refugee camps in Lebanon or Turkey or um, or Jordan uh, because there is no hope in the future there is no schooling where schools can bring some level of normalcy uh, there is no community support sometimes children have to work early so there's child labor there's exploitation by um, extremist groups sometimes and then you have early marriage for uh, young girls oh, oh my goodness so, so. Well, as a psychologist where do you start then that that is almost the, the list is is almost unbearable of the issues that young people and their parents and adults are having to manage with? What, what's the toolkit that you can give them? I think the most important thing is, first of all, to educate ourselves and the community that these issues are happening. And it will affect not only the child or the person who's affected with mental illness, but the whole society. Because this is the generation that will be rebuilding their homeland uh, when they go back. So unless we take care of them right now, and we know, first of all, the scale of the problem and how can we uh, deal with it, they're not going to be able to build uh, Syria when they go back from the refugee camps. The other thing that we have to provide resources and put our minds, minds together. I mean, the, the reason that we're talking about this topic today because it's the, the uh, World Mental Health Day. And it's important to bring this issue. Mental health, a problem that is affecting not only refugees, but large number of people. In the Middle East, in Syria, there is a stigma with mental health. So if you are labeled depressed or anxious or have psychosis or PTSD, then people can call you crazy in Arabic, majnoon, that there is this stigma that will stay with you for the rest of their life. And there are very limited resources available. Mm. So, Ahmed, I could see you nodding your head there. I wanted to bring up this tweet uh, from Magdi, who says, there is a lot of stigma on mental health, and there are, in are invisible disabilities that aren't recorded upon arrival to reception centers. So, uh, you know, we talked about when you actually have to, when you leave the conflict zone and you, you do reach safety in one of these other countries, you don't necessarily get screened for that. Should you? And, and is that something that people are aware of? Well, that's why in our peer-to-peer -peer counseling, we make sure to assure the trust and the confidentiality. And that's a, a huge point in assuring that you will not be stigmatized. I mean, like we keep it between us and we always avoid to, when we approach uh, our uh, clients or the people that we offer them the support and we go to them or they come to us, we just make sure to avoid that word psychological or mm -hmm. anything because it is a big burden that we have to overcome every time. Like we do counseling uh, through the online tool in Lebanon or in Syria and we always know that this is a huge obstacle and we have always to avoid it. Emma, I've got some pictures here. You did a, a, a story with National Public Radio in the United States. Have a look here. This is you counseling a newly arrived refugee. How do you start? You don't talk about psychological issues. You don't talk about mental health. What's the conversation you have to work out how much help this new refugee might need? Exactly. 
Well, mostly we, as uh, when we go on an eye level with uh, with the, our uh, client or with the peop with any person who comes for support, we just try to see that on an eye level. We try to see behind the diagnosis or anything. We could start by just giving a lot of empathy and I myself experience things. I am a human. We all have stressors. We all went through a lot of things in our lives. And that's not a shame. So mm -hmm. let's create the safe space in our counseling session where we can just together have a mutual understanding based on a very critical cultural approach mm -hmm. in our counseling on the mother language, which is a huge also obstacle in Germany in the mental health system and then the the person just to feel to feel that himself or herself seen that itself is a huge start and then we assure that understanding a mutual understanding for what's happening we go through a lot of awareness and through a lot of uh, psychoeducation where we assure to our client that they can be actually in charge and on the driver's seat of their lives through the resources they're reconnecting them to their poten potentials and letting them feel that they can be coping with whatever has happened to them. Yes, the trauma would stay, the PTSD I... would stay, but after all, I would say we can cope. We have coping strategies and we're humans, we're still alive. I, I just want to bring this uh, to reality in different aspects because many times when, you, when we go into medical missions to a refugee camp, let's, let's say a Zatari camp, where I went there, six months ago in Jordan. And that's in Jordan. In, Jor it? in it's Jordan. It's a giant camp. It's the largest uh, camp, refugee camp in the world after a uh, camp for Somali refugees in Kenya. Mm -hmm. It's the fifth largest city in Jordan. Mm -hmm. uh, more than 170,000 refugees lived in it at one point. Now it's about 80,000. So I had this uh, patient who came to me. Uh, I'm an internal medicine specialist. So she came to me with some aches and pains and headache and abdominal pain. She was 80 years old. She was uh, forced to flee from her city near Dar'a. And I could not figure why she has all of these hurtings. Then I asked her, why are you still in this camp? Why don't you go back to Dara? And then she told me, and she started to cry. And she told me, I lost everything, my son. I lost my home. I lost my neighborhood. Uh, I'm living here stuck with my uh, old uh, husband. And I cannot go back. And I figure out that this is a patient who is dep depressed. And what we're seeing usually is the somatization, the symptoms of depression and anxiety manifesting itself as headache, abdominal pain, and so mm -hmm. forth. So you have as a physician to try to treat the person behind these aches and figure out what's happening. In order to do that, you have to understand the culture and understand the, the body language and understand that sometimes pain means headache, it means anxiety, or means PTSD, and so forth. We see that a lot in children as well. Um, most of the time, they don't have the words to express themselves, so they somatize some of their symptoms. And I do agree with Ahmed that it actually starts by building a relationship with them, understanding them, seeing them as human beings more than refugees. They are human beings. They are children. They are families. So if you connect on that very uh, fundamental, basic human level, then you create a relationship, and that's what's healing because um, they the the loss of hope is what's what's keeping them in that despair, in that anxiety, in that depression state. So if you give them the skills, which are really important, the coping skills, and show them how they can cope and how they can process their trauma, but also if you can give them hope to, to keep going and to, to look forward to the future, that's when you actually create this healing, safe environment for them to thrive in. So they are, yes, they are the survivors of our trauma, but they are also the potential thrivers out of this trauma. And there is the traumatic growth, post-traumatic growth that can happen. And we do see that in children when they are given the opportunity. And we do see that in even in adults when they are given the opportunity and the safe space. Mm. And so online, we're getting su suggestions for how best to go about that. Here's one uh, that our team here thought was interesting and because we didn't know if it'd be possible. So this is Michael, and he says, provide televised counseling services. And Ahmed, I'm going to throw this over to you because I know you do something similar. You actually do speak to refugees who are in camps in uh, uh, Lebanon or, and, and places that are not where you are, and you talk to even them. Syria. Tell us about that. How does that work? Yeah, exactly, because the idea was is to, to reach as much as we can uh, and to do the psychosocial support 
whatever we need it. So we we offer our services actually as long as we have the capacity for face to face and uh, for our uh, for any refugee or migrant here to come for a free counseling in our center. As long as we have the capacity for that, we offer it. We also cooperate with the other organizations to pay for our services in order to provide for a certain group of uh, people and for specific needs based on languages or whatever. But it was very meaningful for me and for us as a group of uh, peer-to-peer counselors to reach the Syrians in Lebanon and to reach them in Syria itself, which reconnects me personally to, uh, to Syria or to Lebanon and to see how much it could be little very strange differences between how people see stories there or here or express their pain or their dignity or whatever. And we offer that uh, through uh, our platform, which was made especially to have uh, confidential counseling uh, online, which is uh, epso-care.com. And uh, we do that through organizations uh, that uh, give the awareness and what we do to the people uh, in the camps, they go around, and we have community mobilizers with internet points where the the client would come and just have uh, an appointment, and based on the cultural and male or female uh, approach, they would just choose a counselor, and then on that uh, date they will have us, or on that appointment they will have the counselor ready and have as many sessions as they as they need and have the support. I want to share you one story from 2014 where a little girl um, had stopped speaking because of the trauma from being involved and in being a civilian during the Syrian war. Have a look at this because I, I want to talk to you guests about resources and how much money there is. Have a look. Mm. Farah hasn't said a word in over a year. She's been silent since her street in Damascus was heavily shelled. Her condition is called selective mutism. She points at things to communicate. And this is a common condition among Syrian children. Shahid was mute for a year. She has spoken again after treatment, but now suffers from a speech impediment and requires specialized speech therapy, which her family cannot afford. <laughs> If she sees a laser, she thinks it's a sniper. If she hears a thump, she thinks it's a bomb. The girl is living in fear. Leila, we've just heard of a few examples, a few families, a few refugees, but there are so many who really need help. Where is it on the list of priorities for refugees' needs in terms of mental health care? Unfortunately, mental health care is not on the top of the priority list when survival um, is, the top of the, is on the top of the uh, list. So the basic shelter and the access to a healthcare system in, in emergencies and um, basic food needs, water, clean water, these are the priorities for the families or heat in the, water, in the winter time. Um, however, um, as the invisible wounds, these mental health issues are really important and they can be life crippling. Most of the children are still living in this fight or flight or even free state like this little girl was. And we need to get them move away from that state. And for that, they need a safe space. They need to be able to trust us to want to come back to this world and to give it another shot. And it is in our hands to, to win them over again. But if we just ignore the problem, if we just um, don't want to talk about the mental illness problems and the lack of resources, um, then it, the problem is just going to grow. It's not going to go away on its own. I just want to highlight the, the fact that sometimes solution is there, but we don't pay attention to it, mm -hmm. which is schools. Uh, schools for children is a way of coping. And many times children are, in the, in, especially in the refugee camps, do not have access to regular schooling. More than 250,000 children, in, Syrian children in Lebanon, don't go to school. So providing school will give some level of normalcy. And also training community leaders on how to address the mental issues, training the trainers. We have to come with creative ideas, uh, because there is shortage of mental health specialists in Syria, in Jordan, in Lebanon. All right, Dr. Zahir, thank you so much. Founder of Med Global, uh, Leila Adja Akdi is from the Maya Foundation, and Ahmed Shahabi is from the International so Psychosocial Organization, three organizations that you can contribute to, support to help the mental health of Syrian refugees. Thanks for watching, everybody.